The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, though some doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And know that I am with you always, until the end of time. Brothers and sisters, the Gospel of the Lord. I've just been told that the electricity has all gone out. <laughs> so we didn't turn the fans off deliberately. It's just they're not working at the moment, and neither is the organ. So thank you for struggling on to the choir, and a good reminder to me to keep it short, which I intend to do. Thank God for a few aircon machines. They're still working on the upper level. John and Josephine have been married for 40 years. And uh, for the last 17, they've been living alone together, we can say. After all, their children have fled the nest, been educated, got jobs, found their own lives. And um, when asked why they still enjoy each other's company, and it's quite obvious they still do, they say, well, Josephine, the ladies normally talk about these things with more ease than men, they say, oh, we've always had a healthy respect for each other's differences. That one thing and the other one is that we have learned to communicate honestly with each other. The comfortable stuff and the more difficult stuff. And she also said, and he agreed, that we wish we had started to do that a little earlier in the marriage. It might have made things easier, but perhaps we, it took the difficulties and the hardships to make us mature enough to communicate honestly. That sounds like a good marriage to me. A marriage that's organic, that is growing, that leaves space for further development. It's also a reminder to us that even when you live with someone for 40 years, you can never say that you fully know the person. There's something always of mystery to another human being. In fact, we're a mystery to ourselves, never mind to anyone else. And it's in that sense that we call today the mystery of the Trinity. It's not that the Trinity is some like algebra or, I don't know, algorithm that nobody will ever understand. It's not that that it's inaccessible to us, but it's that it's a mystery just like the human mystery that we're always delving more and more into, learning more and more about, in more and more awe of. Our tradition teaches us that God is one, but three in personhood. In that sense, you know, we take it so much for granted, but it is very different from other world religions, at least two of which, Islam and Judaism, teach very firmly that God is one and only one, and that's it. 
And then on the other side of the house, we have religions like Hinduism or Confucianism say, well, God is very many. You can kind of pick or choose which God or Goddess you like according to your need or preference. And here we are, we can kind of very crudely say in the middle, yes, God is one, but God is a community of persons, a small community. And therefore, we can truly say that God is love because God's love exists in the very heart of God because wherever you have community, there must be love, otherwise the community will split, collapse. And for Christians, our, our way into this community, our blessed entrance to the community, is number one through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's icon to us. He's God's message to us. He's God in flesh to us. But also, as we heard last week in Pentecost, it's only through the Holy Spirit that we're able to say that Jesus is Lord and that Abba is our God Father. So we are plunged into this mystery of God. As Christians and as baptized people, we were told that we're adopted into this family we become partakers of this wonderful movement, dynamic of love that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Totally respecting each other's differences, as John and Josephine have been attempting to do for 40 years. But also, in that very respect, realizing a unity of purpose and a unity of, of love. And that's what we're talking about today. Just a little story before I finish. I happen to be a prison chaplain here in Hong Kong, and our choir have always turned up, and thank you. They also sing in Stanley Prison um, on the major feast days. And quite a few Muslim prisoners from the subcontinent, other parts of the world, and I don't say this out of any disrespect for anyone, but they come to me quietly, very frequently, and they say, could you get me a Bible and in Urdu or Punjabi or Swahili or something? And I'll say, why? They said, we're fascinated by you people. And I say, what people, we people? And they said, you Christians and you Catholics that come here to us, and I'm going, oh, that's nice. What, what, why is that? Oh, you are very kind to us. You sit down with us and you ask us how we are. And how is our wives and how are our children? And how we are feeling? And then they say, you talk to us about a God and Jesus. And we like that because we never heard about it before. We heard, but we're told it's wrong. But now we have a chance to hear a little bit more. And they're fascinated. And some of them even go and ask for baptism. And, and I say, well, we'll go a little bit slowly there because we have to be careful when you go home to Pakistan. It might get a little complicated, but not, not closing any door. But um, it just, and I, my point simply is that just as Jesus is the human face and kindness of God, we, the church, are called to be the trinity of love in action to God's people. That's how people get to God. It's not usually through some direct revelation. It's through friendship, inclusion, respect, and love. And that's what the church is supposed to be. Look at us from all the nations of the world here. Where would you get this ever anywhere else? We come together with our different languages, with our different cultures, and we're all here 
professing faith in one God, receiving one Eucharist, baptized into the one Spirit, and asked to create a world that reflects the life of the Trinity. If only we really got Christianity, we wouldn't have this terrible enmity, hatred, prejudice, ignorance of the camps of our world. It's because we have never really embraced any of our world religions, including Christianity. Its message of inclusiveness, its message of love, its respect for a tolerance of difference, its celebration of difference. That's why we have all the problems we have. And therefore, the mission of the church is to be the community of love in the midst of the conflict, in the midst of the hatred, in the midst of the prejudice. Being Trinitarian in our families, in our workplaces. Trying to deconstruct the prejudices, trying to build the bridges of understanding. So far from this being some theoretical trinity that doesn't make any sense to anyone, it's actually a call to action. It's a mission. It's a mission to be love in the world. A love that respects, a love that has a space, a love that welcomes, a love that builds up just as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, though distinct, are so much in love that they are one. So may it long be said of the Christians, because we can only really legislate for ourselves, see how they love one another.